Studies show mental illness is responsible for 90% of all suicide attempts, further validating the concept that suicide is not a choice, it's a health issue. Nevertheless, one person dies by suicide every 40 seconds somewhere around the world. Our next guests know about suicide firsthand. By sharing their stories, they're hoping to erase the shame and stigma surrounding suicide. At 19, Kevin Hines leaped off the iconic Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. He regretted the decision the instant he jumped. Thankfully, he survived and has released a memoir about the experience. Cracked but not broken is a powerful story, and he's also dedicated his life to speaking out about suicide prevention and mental health awareness. Joining us via satellite is Eric Marcus. When Eric was only 12 years old, his father committed suicide. Then he lost a sister-in-law to suicide some three decades later. He's now the Senior Director of Loss and Bereavement Programs for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. He's also authored Why Suicide? Questions and Answers About Suicide, Suicide Prevention, and Coping with the Suicide of Someone You Know. I want to thank both of you for coming in and talking to us. Kevin, why don't I begin with you? And Eric, I'm going to ask you the same question. Was it cathartic to write the book? Was it painful to revisit this chapter in your life? Uh, helpful? How would you describe the process? Or a mixture of all? All of the above. Yeah. It was very cathartic to write the book uh, after having uh, gone over the story so many times in my life and having so many people ask me to write a book, to put it in paper. Uh, it took four years. It took a year to find a publisher. Uh, and it was published. And uh, it's now helping people across the world. There's a handbook at the end of it on the art of living mentally well. And people are taking to it and they're, they're utilizing it in their everyday life. How about you, Eric? Uh, did you find it uh, a catharsis, or, or was it painful or helpful? It was excruciating. Um, I remember clearly writing the first sentence to the introduction about how my dad's suicide shattered my family's life, and I got up from my desk, and I just wept. Um, it, was, it, was, it was painful to do. I'm glad I did it. Um, I'm glad I revisited the book uh, after my sister-in-law took her life, because I'd had many more years of therapy by that point, and I felt more capable of talking to a lot more suicide loss survivors about their experiences and I could write about my own family in greater detail because I had more courage and could ask them the questions that I didn't ask for the first edition of the book. Um, it's, and, and it was a, a great excuse to talk to my family and ask them the things that, that I was afraid to ask. And, and what did you find in that process? Well, I got a lot of answers. Uh, I recall blaming my uncle, my dad's brother, for not doing more. And in interviewing him, and I have a lot of him in the book now, uh, I found out a lot about what his, his experience was like. He was only 32 when my da dad took his life. My dad was 44. He was a kid um, dealing with something he'd never dealt with before, and, and his parents couldn't cope. So I've learned a lot more. And just this past week, my sister, brother, and I sat down for the first time and talked about our dad's suicide. That's 44 years after the fact. And I learned things about their experience, experiences of that loss that I, that I really didn't know. And it was comforting to learn more. Um, you mentioned he was a kid. Kevin, I, we don't normally do this, but I'd like you to just read maybe these first two sentences because this is chapter three, and it really illustrates that you were a kid as well. Certainly. Uh, the chapter three, the night before, I was just a kid, only 19 years old, when I jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge. I was, in essence, at the very beginning of my life, yet I could only focus on ending it. Talk to us about that moment when it's crystal clear because you walk through it and I thought it was fascinating in your book you, you you wake up your dad and he's like what are you doing waking me up you go to the school to drop your classes I mean you're trying to you've given away so much I mean these are kind of clear signals but they're not being picked up on and you wanted anybody at that moment to stop you walk us through that so, whole experience so uh, my father that that morning of my attempt had come into my room and he said Kevin I want you to come to work with me today I'm very worried about you. I don't know what to do. I am not a doctor. I'm a banker. And he said, I just think you should be with me today. And there was my opportunity to say, Dad, I need your help. But I couldn't because I was not yet ambivalent. I could only see death. I could only see darkness. There was no light at the end of my tunnel. And so uh, we, we got to City College campus. He dropped me off. He told me he loves me, and he told me to be careful that day. I told him I loved him back. I stepped out of the car. A tear rolled off, a tear rolled off my right cheek onto my shoe. It's vivid. I will never forget it. My father drove away, and I thought to myself, this is the very last time I will see anybody I love, and the very last time anybody I love will ever see me. And I went down to the campus, and I dropped my, the majority of my units, which they didn't tell me would drop me of my medical coverage. 
Mm. Now I survived, so you ask how that affected my family in a huge way. Wow, and you thought you were protecting them in a sense. They wouldn't have to do all this cleanup after you took your life. My impulsive and uh, irrational thoughts led me to believe that I was going to make it easier for them to transition. I was going to uh, loosen the burden. They wouldn't have to go to school and drop all the courses. What I, in fact, did was make it much more difficult. Wow. Mm -hmm. The experience itself, uh, it wasn't necessarily jumping. It was running and jumping. I mean, talk to us about that. You know, uh, people always ask me, you know, what led to that attempt? Uh, and it was it's quite simple. Bipolar disorder type 1 with psychotic features. Hearing voices in my head saying that I had to die, that I had no other option. These voices were coming, becoming uh, uh, de to decimals I could not fathom or explain to you. They were screaming in my head. It was a compulsion. I never decided to take my life. I only believed I had to. And that's what needs to come across in, in, with suicidal people is that epic amount of emotional and mental pain they are damaged in. And that is what the pain is what leads them to take their lives or attempt to take their lives. And Eric, the flip side of this is the family left behind to try and sort through all of this, uh, the anger, the hurt. Uh, you know, you talked about some of these emotions. Um, what's it like for you to sit here and listen to Kevin's side of the story since you were on the other side? Oh, it's such a heartbreak. And for anybody who's lost someone to suicide, we wish that they uh, had, had survived their attempt. And it is helpful for me to hear, has been helpful to hear about other people's experiences. The, uh, one of the heartbreak pieces of this is another piece, is that for those of us who have a loved one who is men mentally ill or uh, depressed in ways we don't know, um, it sounds like Kevin's father might not have known the, the, the real danger. It's so hard to see it. People operate on different channels in their lives so that while on the one hand someone might appear normal on the outside, on the inside they might be hearing voices as Kevin said he did. So people knew with my dad that he was in danger of taking his life. He talked about it, mm -hmm. but no one actually believed he'd do it. Um, and in fact, he didn't. His, he uh, he overdosed and then uh, lived for three days um, before mm -hmm. dying. Everyone expected him to recover. He was a very strong man. Uh, but in the aftermath, you can only imagine the kind of blame that went from relative to relative. Everyone blamed my mother. I blamed my uncle. It was just, and, it went and, every, and everyone blamed themselves for the loss. And. So the challenge for them at the time in 1970 was that there was nowhere to get help. And today there's so much help there, help out there for people who are mentally ill or suicidal and for the families left behind. And that's why I'm in this privileged position of doing the, the work I do now, helping people who've been left behind in the aftermath of a suicide. And, and Eric's talking about that, that other side. I want to get your take. I mean, you survived this episode. Uh, you have to move forward. Uh, how difficult was it for your family and, and for you? And Well, let's talk about my family, first of all, because they live every day uh, in fear of that phone call. They live every day in fear, at least quite a few of them, uh, of that phone call saying that Kevin has taken his life. I have chronic suicidal ideations. They live with me on a regular basis. All of the symptoms in my book that I describe occur today and every day. I just am able to cope with them, and I've become so very self-aware with my personal protector network, my family, my friends that are right there with me, that when I feel uh, the inclination of a suicidal thought, instead of acting on that thought, I ask someone closest to me to take me to a, a psych ward so I can be admitted, so I can be safe for that time being. Uh, that's something I've had to learn to do. That's something I've had to take full responsibility for, which is extremely difficult with a mental illness as severe as mine. My family. Uh, dealt with a great deal of emotional and mental pain and trauma because of what I did. Um, and uh, that, that pain uh, stays with them because it was so drastic. And so I, I feel terrible for that, but I, I hope we can come to that trust one more day and realize that this is not going to happen. I'm not going to take my life by suicide. What about suicide prevention? Some of these issues, it doesn't seem like uh, when it comes to budgets as a public health issue that th this is not really an issue that's addressed much. What needs to happen? Kevin, I'll start with you and Eric. I want to give you a chance to chime in too. Well, there's a note that people take and they say that for every suicide there are six people directly affected. That's false. For every suicide there are hundreds of people that are directly affected. Uh, and in those people that are directly affected we're talking about funeral costs, we're talking about uh, costs for the mental health treatment, we're talking about an exorbitant amount of money being spent on uh, people w without treatment. So if we, if we implore our governments to fund suicide prevention wholeheartedly, fully, as they would fund something uh, more effective to, in their minds, um, we, could, we could reverse uh, not just the trends of suicide around the country, but we could reverse things like homelessness, uh, joblessness, um, 
uh, leaving a, a work uh, on a mental health or sick day because of your brain. Uh, we could do all these things and save this nation so much money by addressing mental health, by addressing suicide prevention as opposed to uh, coming in afterwards. Let's get it before it happens. Let's go to every level of school, and I mean every level, uh, from the time kids can comprehend what the word suicide can mean uh, because uh, we know now that you, you, don't, you don't give them the idea by talking about it if they're not thinking about it. If they are thinking about it, they're more than likely to hear what you have to say and tell you the truth about their pain. Mm -hmm. But if we go back to the younger kids, starting from, I would say, around fifth grade on, uh, talking about prevention, mental health awareness uh, on a regular curriculum in our schools, eventually the tide would change because everyone would grow up educated about mental illness. And I think that's one of the things we must change in this country. Eric? Yeah, Mike and, and Kevin, I agree with what you said. The, the key is when we talk about heart disease and heart attacks, we don't talk about preventing heart attacks. We talk about good heart health. And the way to prevent suicide is to promote good mental health. And for those of us who've been through the suicide of a loved one, I've been very conscious of my own mental health, which meant, meant that I started seeing a therapist when I was in my mid-30s to make sure that I was in better shape at age 44 than my father was, because I feared that I might do the same thing he did. And one way to break the cycle of suicide, at least in families where there has been suicide, is to make sure that people get help, that they reach out. And that's the key with all of this, reaching out, not living in isolation, whether you're someone who is suicidal, suffering from mental health, or you've lost someone to suicide, don't do it alone. You don't have to. And that's actually what got me to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention in the first place. Two weeks after my sister-in-law took her life, I went to a, a, a Survivor Day event because I decided I couldn't do it alone this time. I did it alone when I was 12. I wasn't going to do it alone when I was 50. And no one has to. Eric, what, what kind of a difference has you going out, telling your story, made not just on yourself, but on the people that you talk to? and and uh, how much does that buoy you each day, would you say? Well, it buoys me to know that, that by sharing my own experience, I can touch other people who've been through this experience, and they can feel more open. I re recall being on vacation not that long ago, and a woman asked me what I did for my work, and I, I said that I, I wrote a book about suicide. I've written other, other things. And uh, the next morning at breakfast, she came over to me, and she whispered in my ear. She said, I'm like you. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, my mother and grandmother both killed themselves. I've never told anyone. Mm. And by talking about it myself, it opened up a conversation. And I'm always so surprised that when I speak about it, whether it's publicly or you know, privately on a holiday, um, people open up to me and tell me what they've been through. And by connecting in that way, um, you can change someone else's life um, so that they don't feel alone in their experience. And that's, a, in, a, in essence, uh, I know you speak a lot of places. Uh, it's basically giving people permission to talk about Something they, as I said, closeted. Just like Eric said, whether publicly or in private with friends and family, what happens when you, when you are honest about your true struggles is that people begin to be honest about theirs. Uh, I've had people stand up in my audiences in front of thousands of people and for the very first time in their lives discuss that they have a very severe mental illness and that they have thoughts of suicide and that they need help that night. I was in Camp Lejeune at the Marine Base uh, in New Bern, North Carolina. A Lance Corporal came up to me after my speech. I spoke to 10,000 uh, 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 Marines in two days. And this young Marine, he was a Lance Corporal, he came up, he didn't say a word. He unpinned his Lance Corporal Chevron, his rank pin, he put it on my lapel, mm -hmm. and he said, I was going to kill myself today. Now I'm going to go talk to my CO. Will you walk me there? Wow. wow. And I walked him yep. there. Wow. Go, yeah, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, Kevin, I just want to say how much I admire you for speaking out and being public. And I see this in my niece and nephew's generation. That If you had done this in another generation, you would have simply never told anyone what happened. And this way, you're sharing your story with people begins to cut the stigma uh, by, by talking about uh, anybody who speaks about a suicide loss or their experience with mental illness uh, or a suicide attempt helps change the conversation, helps open things up. And so I thank you and admire you for doing that. Well, powerful messages, very important books. I can't thank uh, both of you enough. Uh, really uh, very important stories and really appreciate both of you sharing them today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Coming up next, this week's Full Frame Close-Up, we'll meet a storyteller who is weaving together a patchwork of stories that's demonstrating what makes us all human.